Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Thank you so much for tuning in once again to the Church World Confessions podcast. I'm your host, Emmanuel Lee Heke. Um, and I've been having a pretty good life. I've been, I've been pretty okay. I hope you've been okay too. I hope you've been good too. Um, a lot of, I'm going through, through a transition period in my life right now. Um, God's been good. God's been faithful. It is finals week for me, so I could definitely use some prayers in that regard. Um, just got to stay disciplined. Um, last week of uh, the semester, y'all, so we're trying to power through it right now, man. I know a lot of you guys might be the same. Some of you guys might have finished already, um, and then if you're anything like my my Bruins, my fellow Bruins, um, you're on the quarter system, so finals isn't until next month, but may God be with us all, man. May God be with us all. Nevertheless... This message I'm going to preach today is definitely going to be a message of encouragement similar to last week, just in terms of really staying on this topic of suffering, Um, just because, you know, you know, I I love to hear when everybody's doing good. But as 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 we I feel like our generation, as we get older, we're, we're getting past this phase where we might have thought that life with Jesus or might have even been told that life with Jesus is paradise. Um, life with Jesus will be paradise when we're in paradise, New Jerusalem or heaven. Um, but right now life with Jesus is life being lived in a broken, sinful world that sometimes can, can feel like paradise, but then a lot of the times can also, you know, be accompanied with a lot of trials and tribulations and so on and so forth. And last week we talked about how a lot of us, when we go through the suffering, when we go through the trials and tribulations, we tend to think that God is not near us, that God is mad at us, that God disapproves of us, or that we don't have enough faith. And that's the reason why our experience in this suffering has not come to an end yet. But then we talked about how sometimes God allows that season of suffering to persist, that season of tribulation, because in Romans chapter 5, it talks about how through the tribulation, he gets his glory. Because the tribulation gives way to perseverance within us, and perseverance gives way to character, good character, and that good character gives way to hope and assurance in the Lord. Because God wants us to be holy as he is holy. God cares about our righteousness. God cares about us being like Jesus Christ, not just about us being comfortable and feeling good all the time. So today I wanted to expand on that. I wanted to keep on going with that because there are many of us that might, hey, your life is great right now. Amazing. That's so good. But some of us that our lives are very hard right now and we're trying to figure out when is God going to ease up a little bit? When is life, sorry, rather, is going to ease up a little bit? And then, you know, there's also some of us that things are going really good. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're very anxious about the next bad thing that can happen. You know, I know for me, uh, I almost got in a really bad car accident last week, a really bad car accident. That was the closest it's ever come to something really bad, really bad one. It was a normal day. It was going to continue to be a normal day. Dropping my sister off at the airport. Car just swerves in. I kid you not. Swerves into us. Swerves into us straight up. But God guided that car. I almost lost complete control of that car. I was driving. I almost lost complete control of that car. But I did not. And God guided us. And we were. And when I tell you the one, the car wasn't hit and we weren't hurt. I was scared though. I was scared. I, I was shook up after that. You know, even when things can be going good and it just looks like a great day, anything can come at any time and just throw us off on the, on the flick of a dime. Sometimes, you know, bad things can come. The time of suffering can come. Hard times can come. And it's important that we as believers are equipped for these times. Not to say that you should always be anxious and worried about these times. That's the complete opposite of what I'm saying. We need to understand that God is a God that is with us in the bad times so we do not fear the bad times. We need to understand that the suffering is not a sign of God's absence because sometimes God is there with us. Well, not sometimes. God is always with us. And he chooses, rather than to just take us out of the tribulation immediately, he chooses to be there with us. I'm very much aware that we're a few minutes into this episode, and now I remember now that I completely forgot the announcements. The announcements are the same as they've always been. Of course, we have Bible study tonight. Um, hope to see you there. 
And if at any point in time you feel led to donate to this ministry, as many of you have been doing, and I'm thankful so much, if you feel led, www.unassociate.com slash donate. Sorry I didn't say that in the beginning. Sorry to pause and cut that off, but I did want to say those things. And more information about the Poetry Jam is coming. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I want to talk about Philippians 4.13 today. Philippians 4.13 is one of the most popular verses in the entire Bible. It's up there with John 3.16. I remember when I was a kid, we used to sing a song. I can do all things, all things, all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13, you know? It's probably like the number one, like, Bible verse for a lot of athletes as well, you know, because because we like that encouragement that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, there are a lot of interpretations for that verse. And I'm being quite completely honest with you. I have a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of beef about how people interpret that verse. I wouldn't call it beef, but it, I don't think that a lot of people's common interpretation of that verse is completely accurate. Right. Like a lot of the times we use that verse within the context of like you know, God's going to make us victorious in a certain situation. We're going to overcome this challenge. We can do all things as in we can accomplish anything with Christ. You know, he's going to help me win in this competition or he's going to help me get a promotion or overcome, be victorious over some type of enemy. And all of that is true. So that's why I don't call it beef. All of that is absolutely true. And you can find a number of scriptures that will help you support that point because that is a very true principle. We serve a sovereign God who is all powerful God who can strengthen you to do absolutely anything. That's a fact. But I do think that there are better verses and better passages in the Bible besides Philippians 4.13 to use to 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 uh, substantiate that principle. You can use places like Psalm 27. You can use Isaiah 41, verse 13. You can use Zechariah 4, um, verse 6. All of these different verses that talk about God's power being almighty and through his power we can overcome, through his power we can withstand, through his power we can be victorious in all things. Because he's already overcome the entire world and if we're in him then we're already victors or more than conquerors through Christ over everything. All that stuff is cool, you know, but I'm just saying that when it comes to Philippians 413, I'm not going to police it and say that you can't use it for that context. I just think that here's here's my my opinion is that the contextual meaning of the verse Philippians 413 is so good and is so applicable to people who are in, in, in times of suffering that when we try to um, kind of like even unintentionally add our own interpretations to it, it dilutes the meaning. Um, but, but this is a great, this is a great verse. And I want to talk about his contextual meaning today. Philippians four, let's read the context around it. Philippians four, starting at verse 10 to verse 13. It says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last, uh, uh last your care, by the way, this is apostle Paul speaking to, of course, the church of Philippi. At last your care for me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. So they started, you know, sending him stuff again, you know, a little care package or something like that. Not that I speak in respect of wants. I'm not acting like I'm, you know, all about wanting things. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Mm. There's a clue right there. I know both how to be a base and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Philippians 413. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. I can be in the times of abasing and times of abounding. I can have a lot and I can have a little. I can suffer need. And I, I can have abundance in all these situations. I can be content because I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. The way I really like to, you know, help people understand, it's like he's saying I can endure all things. I can experience all these things and still stand because Christ is the source of my strength. When you acknowledge that context, you realize that this verse it's not so much about overcoming enemies and obstacles as much as it is enduring 
enemies and obstacles. As much as it is enduring and persevering through tribulation and through times of where it just appears like we don't have the necessary resources in order to continue going. But we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Of course, God has overcome everything and he can empower you to overcome anything too. Absolutely, that's a fact. But the reason why this verse and the context of this verse is so important is because sometimes God takes his time to deliver us from suffering and seasons of tribulation. Sometimes he takes a long time, as we would judge it. Sometimes we've been praying to him, we've been fasting, we have been asking him with faith, with real faith, I tell you. We'll be on our face asking God, when is this suffering season of suffering going to end? And then it's just it just continues for a long time. We've been praying for days. We've been praying for weeks, months, years, even decades, maybe. And it hasn't stopped. And at this point, man, huh? you start to question yourself. You start, I've been going through this for a long time. And at this point, I don't see any sign I'm going to be delivered from this suffering. You start to get confused. Your mind starts to race. You start to panic. And then the thought comes. Hmm. God has not delivered me from the situation. It must be that he has forsaken me. Boom. Whether it's from your flesh, whether it's from the world around you, whether it's the thought is planted by the devil himself, the thought comes into your mind. I've been looking for God to deliver me from this suffering and God has not delivered me from this suffering. It must mean that God has forsaken me. But, 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 if God truly is not a liar, if he truly is not a liar, the conclusion is not that God has forsaken you because he said that he will never leave you nor forsake you. So how do we explain the fact that we have been praying for a deliverer? We have been looking for a deliverer, but we have not found him. And we say to ourselves, why hasn't God done this? And why hasn't God done that? Where is he, by the way? We are looking for our deliverance, but we cannot find it. We're looking for our deliverer, but we cannot find him. But I'm here to say that maybe the reason why you cannot find your deliverer is because you have not fully recognized who God is. You have not fully recognized the multiple roles that God plays. Yes, he is a deliverer. He is a deliverer all the time, but he's not just the deliverer. God is also your helper. Yes, he has multiple roles. Sometimes he chooses to appear as the hand that reaches down and pulls you out of tribulation. And other times he chooses to appear on the rock that you can stand on and withstand the suffering and the tribulation. Yes. Yes. So you're looking for a deliverer. And yes, God is him. But you're looking for a hand to reach out and pull you out. But instead, he's the ground that you're walking on. Hmm. Isaiah 43. Starting at verse 1. God speaks to the children of Israel. He says, but now, thus says the Lord... Who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, you shall, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Wow. Wow. I, 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 I've been looking and it's hard for me to, to find a place where God promises that you will never pass through the waters. The waters will not bother you. And, and he says that the, the, you'll never pass through the rivers. You'll never have to experience the rivers in your life or that you will never go through the fire because, you know, you won't have to worry about the fire. Fire will not, you know, you'll never experience that stuff. That's not what God promised. That's not what God promised. 
God promised that when you pass through the waters, he will be with you. He promised that when you pass through the rivers, they're not going to overflow you. He promised that when you pass through the fire, that they will not scorch you. Meaning that there will be the times in life where God will allow you. Oh, yes, he's there. He sees it. And he's allowing you to pass through and experience the waters, the rivers, and the fires. And our comfort and our courage and our, our peace doesn't get to come from never experiencing those things or from him pulling us out right away. But instead, it comes from us knowing that he's with us and us knowing that there is someone that is in control that is not going to allow this situation to overcome me, to overflow me. Although it looks like Jesus might be sleeping on my boat, I ought not to panic to the extent that I think he doesn't care about me because at any moment he can get up and remind me that he's the one in control because he's sovereign. Easy as saying, peace be still. Oh, ye of little faith. Why did you doubt? Oh, he's not forsaken you. No. He's with you. Just because he doesn't appear in the way that you want him to doesn't mean he's not there. Philippians 4.13 means that when you have a little and when you have a lot, when everything is working in your favor and when things just aren't working out, you can do all things through Christ, which strengthens you. Because the things of this life are not your source. Mm -mm. You know, a lot of people nowadays, they talk about protect my peace, protect my peace, protect my peace, protect my peace. Hmm. Peace shouldn't have to be protected. Because what that tells me is that your peace is dependent on avoiding confrontation. It's dependent on avoiding the discomfort, avoiding tribulation. That's what a lot of people do. That's that's them protecting their peace. It's backing off. It's cutting people off. It's it, it's it's staying home. It's doing this, doing that. See, but Jesus gives us a different peace. It's the peace that is not dependent on the environment around you, but it's a peace that comes from within and can remain constant through all the different situations and the, and the valley of the shadow of death and the seasons of tribulation that you might experience in life. That's the peace that Jesus gives. I didn't write it down, but one of my favorite passages in the Bible was Isaiah 26. Keep those, he keeps those in perfect peace whose mind are stayed on him. Isaiah 26, verse 3. I think I said that last week, too. He gives us enough. He gives us the strength to continue in those seasons, in those hard seasons, in those challenging seasons. That's what he appears to, to do sometimes. That's what he comes to do. I remember, I, I told you guys about the story that I was sitting down right here on this bed. I was sitting down and I was saying, you know, I, I have my journal. At this point, it's 2021. I'm unemployed. I am not a student. All I'm doing every day is just focusing on Associated and watching TV. <laughs> you know, I, I, was, I was having my devotion time with God and I journaled my devotion time. I wrote out on Associated Job School. I feel like each of these things are things that I need to be doing, but I know that I can't do all three of these things. So, God, you tell me <clears throat> which ones will I do. Pick two. <laughs> This is me talking to God. <laughs> I said, pick two. I'll do those two. And then the other one will have to go. And I know it's going to be a hard decision, but this is this is what it is. Pick two and then we'll go. And soon, God, God I got the response. I was praying. I was fasting. I was, I'm serious. This is Emmanuel. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what, what am I going to do? Because I can't do all three. That was that was a decision I came to myself. I can't do all three. <laughs> And then, then uh, God reminded me that he said that if anyone wants to be my disciple, that he has to deny himself, pick up.
pick up his cross and follow me. <laughs> That's what I got. And God told me straight to my face, this is your cross to bear. You're doing all three. Whoa. Whoa. You're doing all three. Hello? It's like when Moses had told him that, hey, I'm, I'm not a really the greatest speaker, so I don't, I don't know why you're choosing me. And then he had to remind Moses that who's the one that made man's mouth? Because, you know, sometimes we forget that we don't even have the authority to say what we can and cannot do. You didn't create yourself. You didn't. You don't even know the type of capacities that God has put in you. How are we ever going to have the audacity? How could we ever have the audacity to stand before God and say that I can't do something? That's ridiculous. Especially when we also recognize that he is our source of strength. So yes, we can go through the hard times. We can go through the challenging times. But it's important that when we go through these hard times, these challenging times, we remember that Christ is the one that's strengthening us. We remember, like Isaiah 43, I had read this verse a million times, but now when I started to read it, it started to mean something so different for me. I'm over here, even, even when I started working and when I started doing school and I started doing an associate, I'm thinking to myself, like, man, this is really hard. Oh, my gosh. Like, I, I ain't going to hold you. That first semester, I thought about dropping out. The first time in my life I ever considered dropping out of school. But then the Holy Spirit reminded me that I won't allow the rivers to overflow you. So when I, when I acknowledged that I had to come to the realization, I had to snap out of it. No, it's not that this thing is too big for me. No, it's not that I should be here pitying myself. I need to get up and get after it because God has given me the resources. He's given me the strength. Because you know something about suffering? The hardest thing about suffering sometimes is not the physical pain that you feel, but it's the added self-pity that we put on top of it because we pity ourselves. Oh my gosh, look at me. How can I be in this situation? How do I find myself in this situation? Why am I going through all these different things? The self-pity. Self-pity never did anything good for nobody. I'm going to say it like that. Not to say that you're not pitiful. Not to say that someone shouldn't pity for, not and pity you, not to say that it's like I don't feel bad. But sometimes when we frolic, when we indulge, because it's a temptation, when we indulge in self-pity, it only adds to the burden that we are carrying. It adds more weight to the cross that we are bearing. But to combat that self-pity in the times of tribulation, we have to remember. That you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. He's your strength. He's your strength. He is your strength. Romans 5, we talked about how the tribulation goes to perseverance. And the perseverance produces good character. And good character leads to a more hope and assurance in the Lord. Because God puts us in those tough situations so we can grow in our confidence and our hope and our assurance in him. And it didn't just start now. No, this is always this has been a thing for for. I mean, we can go back to all the way to the Old Testament like we're about to. Deuteronomy chapter eight. Um, I'm water. Just a little bit. Deuteronomy chapter eight. We're going to start at verse two. At this point, um, the Israelites, they're out of Egypt. You know, they've been, they went through the entire journey and now they're at the tail end of their journey. Egypt is not that far from the promised land, folks. I don't know if you ever looked at a map before, but it's not that far. It shouldn't have been like an entire generation, 40 years in order for them to reach there. But that's what happened. <laughs> But now they're at the tail end of it, right? Um, and as they're about to, you know, hey, time is coming where, you know, you're going to enter the promised land. God decides to give them a nice talk. Verse two, and you shall remember that the Lord, your God, led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Verse three, pay attention. 
So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna with which I'm sorry, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Y'all know I love that. I love that verse. I'm always quoting it. Mm. That's a real one. The Bible says that God allowed them to hunger. And then after allowing them to hunger, he fed them with manna. I want to ask you a question. This manna, what do you think it tasted like? Yeah, I mean, it came from God. Well, shouldn't it have been the best thing that anyone will ever experience? You think that God is unable to make the best food that we have ever? I mean, come on. It's God, right? But did the manna satisfy the children of Israel? No. Was it meant to satisfy the children of Israel? Well, if it was meant to satisfy the children of Israel, that means that God failed. Because in, in Numbers 11, these people were complaining about the manna. Look at it. Verse 4. It's actually, it's not funny, but sometimes when you just like hear about the children of Israel complaining, it's how like you really see yourself. And that's what makes it funny. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept um, again and said, who will give us meat to eat? <laughs> These are people that saw God split a sea, by the way. Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish we ate in Egypt. You know, they always brought up Egypt again. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Oh, but now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. Ugh! We're so tired of this. <laughs> they were such brats. And we could be brats just like them. I'm not, I'm not pointing the finger. Man, was the manna meant to satisfy the children of Israel? Can't God have come up with some type of dish that would satisfy them forever? It's my opinion. God knew that it wasn't going to satisfy all of their cravings, but the purpose of it was not to satisfy all of their cravings. The purpose of the manna was for them when they were hungry to eat, gather their strength, and continue on their journey in the wilderness to the promised land. Mm. Not there to satisfy all their cravings, but to give them the strength they needed to continue. Mm. Unfortunately, sometimes when we're in this wilderness period of our lives, we want God to show up to satisfy all of our cravings. Or even more so, we want God to show up and boom, we're at the promised land, we're at our destination. He delivers us right out of the wilderness, right away. But instead, God chooses to show up as manna. Not something that satisfies everything that you want, but something that gives you the strength to continue on the journey. He shows up as enough. Not to say that he's not abundantly, infinitely more. But he has intentionally showed up as enough. To give you the strength to continue. And if that's the case, we cannot say that God has forsaken us. You cannot make that accusation. He's there. And he's with you. And when you rely and you rest on him, when you acknowledge that he is there, I'm telling you. You have access to a peace and to a joy and to strength that will truly be able to carry you through. Inevitably. And we have to be careful. Not to look at the manna and become ungrateful like the children of Israel. But instead to look at the manna, look at the enough strength, the strength that God gives us in the time of tribulation. And see it as a reminder that he is with us. We have to see it as a reminder that he is all we need to survive and continue. We need to see it as a reminder that he has not forsaken us. 
Yeah. I understand people's frustration, man. I understand that it's hard. I understand. I understand. I've been through tribulation too. And maybe I haven't been through as much tribulation as you and I don't understand. I don't understand to that extent. I, I, can, I can't even imagine these type of things that you went through. But I do challenge all of us that are waiting on God to deliver us from this season of suffering. And we tried everything to look around you and ask yourself, although it feels like this tribulation is going to kill me, why aren't I dead yet? And the reason why you're not dead yet, the reason why the rivers have not overflowed you, drowned you, the, the, the waters have not destroyed you and the fire has not completely burned you to ash is because Philippians 4.13 says that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You don't have to be scared about tomorrow. You don't have to be scared about the challenge, about the obstacle, about the enemy. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And I've been walking for a long time. But we won't fear. Because we can walk through Christ who strengthens us. <laughs> we can exist. We can endure. We can persevere through Christ who strengthens us. Because he's there and he's holding your hand. Maybe he's not the hand that's pulling you out. But he's the hand that's leading you through. He's the hand that's holding you up. He's the hand that's pushing you forward. And I hope that you recognize that. I hope that you realize that. Hmm. Let's pray. Father God, I, I thank you for this word. And I thank you for this message of encouragement. And I just pray that it truly does touch your children, Lord. That it truly does, oh God, make a shift for those of us that are in these seasons, Lord, of tribulation, oh God. Father, let your glory shine through us in this season of tribulation. It shall not go to rest, Lord. Father, it shall reap perseverance and it shall reap good character and it shall reap, reap more hope in us, O oh God. You will get the glory. You will get the glory. And Father, we're still waiting because one day, of course, we will all be delivered from everything, Lord. Some of us will be delivered from things here on earth, and the other times we'll be we'll all be delivered in New Jerusalem, won't we? No more tears, no more suffering, no more sorrow. We thank you for giving us access to that, oh God. We thank you. Because we are eternal, but our problems are not. These seasons of tribulation are not, but we will exist for the forever with you because of you. And we thank you. We thank you for that, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Hmm. Thank you guys for listening. Again, thank you guys for your love. Thank you for your support. Um, it really means a lot, man. I love getting behind this mic every week. I'm thankful to be here again. I'm thankful for not being, you know, completely, completely being able-bodied sitting behind here again. Um, man, God is with you, man. God is with you. In the big things and the small things, your problem's not too small, by the way. God is with you, and uh, let's acknowledge him. Let's acknowledge his presence. Love you guys. Have a great week. Peace.